so welcome everybody. My name is uh, Runjit Sokhi. I'm uh, the director for the Center for uh, Climate Change Research at the university. And it's my privilege to chair this afternoon session. Um, if you had a chance to go to the website and look at the program of the conference, you will see the, com the conference is on the theme, uh, a highly relevant and highly important theme of climate change. And the perspective is to look at COP26 and beyond. And uh, no doubt uh, most of you, if not all of you, would have been tuning into the TV and following COP26, as I have been, as I did for the for the two weeks, or and and before that as well. And there are lots of lots of outcomes of COP26 that are going to be relevant to today's program. So at the beginning, I really want to thank um, the organizers, uh, Zoe, Austin, Nana. Blumkist and all the people at the UH events for uh, uh, organizing this wonderful uh, conference and giving us an opportunity to talk about um, an issue probably that is the most important at the moment in people's lives. Um, we have three excellent speakers uh, who will be touching on the theme of uh, sustainable transport, but also areas of decarbonization and cleaner fuels. These are the sort of terms that are now become household terms few years ago, hardly anybody knew about what, what was meant by net zero and so on. And now we talk about this all the time. Uh, so the format of today is that we're going to have uh, three talks. They're going to be lasting anything between 15 and 20 minutes. And then we will have a panel discussion. And we are encouraging everybody who's attending this event to put forward their questions on the Q&A please note that the chat function for the attendees is disabled, but please uh, submit your question on the Q&A uh, uh, function, and then uh, we will make sure um, to try and get through as many of the questions as we possibly can. Uh, and I think that is the only, um, the only items that I wanted to cover at the beginning. And let's begin this event. It's now five minutes past three. So I'm going to be inviting Professor Stephen Joseph, uh, who's going, who is from the transport, who is a policy, uh, transport policy advisor, and also is part of uh, the Smart Mobility Research Unit as a visiting professor there. And his talk will be on sustainable transport after COP26. Uh, so over to you, Stephen, and feel free to introduce yourself with a bit more detail uh, as you begin your presentation. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Ranjit, um, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining this event. Um, as Ranjit said, uh, my name is Stephen Joseph. I'm a visiting professor at the University of Hertfordshire's Smart Mobility Unit. I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, I'm a transport policy consultant and um, previously um, was a chief executive of um, the Campaign for Better Transport. Uh, right, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, take you through um, uh, 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 the presentation. Um, so, um, I hope that's working. Um, so, just a bit about the Smart Mobility Unit. Um, it's uh, it does a, a range of things teaching it's got a new masters which i'll come back to it does research it um, has links with uno which you'll hear from in a bit um, and the university's travel plan um, it does consultancy it does seminars and workshops which i'll be talking about in a minute um, and it is multidisciplinary and we're well as you now see part of other university teams like the center for climate change research um, so just to, uh, I'm going to say a little bit about the COP itself um, and transport. There was no formal agreement on transport at the COP, but there were side agreements. Um, in particular, 30 countries and uh, various other people, car makers, cities, regional governments, agreed to make zero emission vehicles the new normal. Um, and um, on, in, uh, on top of that, there were national commitments. The UK, for example, uh, repeated its commitment to phase out uh, diesel um, trucks by 2040. Um, there was a new World Bank fund to support decarbonisation of road transport in developing countries and there were uh, green shipping corridors and undoubtedly this will accelerate the moves towards electric and zero emission vehicles because it will cut costs and it will lead to improving technologies. But 
there is a consensus that on transport much more is needed because just moving cars and vans from fossil fuels to electric or hydrogen won't be enough for either for the transport sector to contribute to the Paris target um, of keeping global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees for the national determined contributions, the NDCs, which countries are supposed to come back to next year to COP27 with a tougher NDCs, and also in the UK for meeting the UK government's net zero target for 2050 and the five year carbon budgets leading up to that. And I, I put a reference in that slide to a particular academic um, uh, paper from the Centre for Research on Energy Demand uh, CREDS. Um, which has summarised this argument. Um, and what this means is that as well as moving to electric vehicles, we need to actually cut vehicle mileage. And I've given uh, one uh, example of the consensus on this. There was a, a, a manifesto earlier this year for decarbonising transport from something called the Greener Transport Council, which had a lot of um, expert people on it drawn from various walks of life. Um, and this concluded that decarbonising transport will mean traffic reduction. It will mean a reform of motoring taxation as we transition from petrol and diesel vehicles. And it will need a credible national programme for delivering behaviour change. But these were hardly mentioned in Glasgow. Uh, there was, uh, into the Sustainable Transport Declaration, there was a sort of last minute addition about the need for wider system, uh, system transformation. And there were also um, uh, adjunct uh, declarations by cities and regions, for example, um, uh, uh, to making the uh, a commitment to go further and talking about this. Um, now, uh, it's not surprising that none of that got really got mentioned at Glasgow, because in general, it's worth noting that politicians prefer talking about technology to talking about behaviour change. And I think that's partly because uh, they've all been spooked by fuel protests here um, 20 years ago, people may remember, uh, older people may remember this. Uh, in France, the Gilets Jaunes, which uh, and the riots which started with protests against fuel tax rises. And in this country also, there's been some politicians have got very bruised by the protests that have emerged about low traffic neighbourhoods, uh, particularly in London and Manchester. It's also the case that public transport post COVID has lost some of its commuting and business travel and it, and some people have uh, are saying they won't use it um, because they're worried about going back into um, confined spaces with some people not wearing masks and so on and there are some big issues there with the funding for buses and trains which we could talk about in questions perhaps however it is worth saying that in fact um, under the radar as it were some government policies are promoting behavior change um, we've had a uh, the government produced in the summer a transport decarbonisation plan. Uh, in fact, I was on the advisory group, the Net Zero Transport Advisory Group to that on behalf of the university, um, with an ambition to reduce traffic in urban areas, stabilise it elsewhere, and a commitment that local transport plans, every day where we'll have to prepare local transport plans, and it will be based on carbon reduction and the funding um, uh, distributed accordingly. There was also the gear change strategy in 2020 and updated in, in 2021, promoting active travel to increase walking and cycling, with new powers and duties for councils. And there's also been the bus back better, bus service improvement plans for every local authority based on increasing bus use and with funding attached. Um, and it's also worth saying that away from national government, from the UK government, um, uh, a lot of places and uh, authorities uh, are going further. So the Scottish Government has a climate action plan, which includes a target to cut traffic by 20% uh, by 2030 on, I think, 2018 levels. The Welsh Government is committed to cutting traffic to a modal shift to public transport and active travel and has launched a formal review of its roads programme. Um, and cities like Manchester and Leeds have clear long-term transport strategies, which commit them to cut traffic and achieving net zero earlier than 2050. And a broader grouping, 93 authorities now, including Hertfordshire and some of the districts like St Albans, have signed a UK 100 net zero pledge, um, which again pledges to move towards net zero earlier than 2050. So uh, at the uh, subnational devolved level, there's a lot going on. Now, what might this mean for places like Hertfordshire? Now, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we organised some round tables um, last year um, on 
uh, to develop a research and policy agenda for places like Hertfordshire, because actually most transport research and policy has focused on cities, and places like Hertfordshire do need attention um, because they have high car ownership, severe traffic congestion, um, and um, relatively poor public transport, especially orbital public transport. And um, uh, and carbon emissions in those counties matter. Um, uh, Shire County transport carbon emissions per head are double those in London, two thirds higher than metropolitan districts. Um, urban and rural districts outside conurbations, the, uh, mixed urban and rural districts that should read outside conurbations account for 60% of the population, but 72% of transport carbon. But there are wide variations between comparable authorities, so there are opportunities for change. Um, so briefly then, these were the sorts of directions of travel that came out of the, those round tables. Um, starting with spatial planning, where new homes are built and the layout and design will have an impact on carbon emissions. I put a reference there to Transport for New Homes, um, which is a grouping I'm an advisor to, um, which has been doing a lot of work on what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, short journeys, many car journeys, even in places like Hertfordshire and more rural areas are short and could transfer to out of travel modes. And there's a sort of propensity to cycle tool, PCT, um, which has done some work on this. I think there's a recognition from several sources that e-bikes could be a game changer, particularly for places like the, the towns and villages in Hertfordshire. Um, they can provide an alternative for longer car trips and first last mile freight distribution even in small towns. Um, Cargodale, um, is a, uh, a, a cycle e-bike delivery uh, system set up in the small uh, West Yorkshire town of Todmorden, um, which is smaller and hillier than most places in Hertfordshire. Um, and uh, it was set up as part of the lockdown, but has um, genuinely um, you know, taken off as people have, um, uh, have come to accept it. Um, and uh, we also looked at uh, public transport, at what Cornwall's been doing with integrated timetables, interchanges, single ticketing system, and increasingly reduced fares actually. Um, and the new bus service improvement plans are opportunities to do more of that. Token transport, joining up different public services um, can help too. And then there's demand responsive transport. And there is debate about this. Uh, we've obviously got the Hertfordshire Links uh, scheme, Hartsink Links scheme just gone in, and we'll hear more about that later, I'm sure. Um, we, there are two sorts of demand responsive transport. There are providers like Via Van and Zelo, um, and also uh, uh, Via Van, and there are also journey aggregators uh, like Zelo, who do actually, I think, provide a service for a cardo to the Hatfield Business Park, um, uh, where they aggregate journeys um, on behalf of employers, say. And Seven Oats, we identified, and we had a presentation from the operator around there, of an area where they've got ordinary bus services and DRT alongside them. And that's quite an interesting um, thing we thought was, um, was worth picking up on. Um, similarly, um, we looked at lift sharing um, as a way of increasing car occupancy. I'll come back to that in a minute, because we, I think that's a, a definitely something that we can start with here. Um, shared mobility, car clubs, shared bike e-bike schemes, um, mobility hubs, bringing different transport modes together, perhaps with local services and workspaces for remote working. Um, and uh, there's a trade body called Como UK, Combined Mobility UK, which has been doing a lot of work on this. And um, we also identified the need to bring people with you. Um, and there are different ways of doing that, given the controversies over, and I know um, Trevor's um, colleagues are facing significant challenges in some places in Hertfordshire about some of the um, active travel scheme, emergency active travel schemes that were brought in. Um, and we identified different people who are working on that. And there's also visitor travel issues in some areas outside cities. A key issue we found was the application and use of data, which we said underpins everything else. I should mention at this point that the Smart Mobility Unit has a data unit within it, um, which is doing a lot of interesting work on identifying and aggregating um, uh, demand for transport and provide and looking at where you might provide new services. So what are the starting points for all of uh, this? Where would, might we go first if we want to do something about this? Well, I think there's uh, commuting. I mentioned uh, work with employers. Um, the government uh, decarbonisation plan has um, a um, 
a, a commitment to something called commute zero. Um, and I put on the uh, illustration there a dashboard on average commuter emission levels, which has been created by Mobility Ways as a way of benchmarking individual employers and areas right down to ward level on what the emissions from commuting are, can't, uh, uh, in that area are and ways of bringing it up. And you can see it looks like one of those uh, things you find on bridges and so on televisions and so on. And that's been very effective at engaging employers and ch giving them a way of charting a route to um, uh, uh, zero emission commuting by their employees. Um, by car, we already have schemes in Watford, a uh, scheme in Watford, Boreham Wood, uh, Hartsmere have just gone out for tender one in Boreham Wood. Um, and that's, and some of those are e-bikes. It's an opportunity to, as I've said, uh, look at ways of expanding that. Look at building on the sustainable travel towns, which Trevor may talk about, active travel zones, school streets, 20 miles an hour zones, and so on. And there's the new DLT Hearts Link, which I suspect Ed will talk about, uh, looking at monitoring and evaluating that. And on spatial planning, there's an opportunity to review highway design for new housing and the new tools for that. So in conclusion, transport wasn't a big feature of the COP. Uh, the focus was on electric vehicles, but there is a consensus that reducing mileage by vehicles will be critical to meeting targets. Uh, we felt that the round tables we did showed that it's possible to cut vehicle mileage and give places like Hertfordshire good alternatives to private car use, and that um, universal SUVs are not the only option, despite what you might read in below the line comments in almost any newspaper that you care to look at um, uh, when, the, when this kind of topic gets raised. Um, and some of this does need government support and longer term funding would make things much easier. But some of this is about joining up and making better use of what exists and enlisting travel generators such as employers joining decarbonisation programmes. And I should, of course, say that the university uh, itself has been very effective in doing such a travel plan and in reducing um, uh, some, uh, well, the student and some employee uh, single occupancy car use. Now, the SMU will continue to research these issues and identify network of practice, and we'll be happy to work with others on this. And as I said, with the new Masters in Transport Planning coming in, there will be opportunities for placements and research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Now, there was a little bit of an issue with the, the volume of the sound. It, um, oh, it, it, it don't, I don't think it was too bad, but it sort of improved and then sort of went down. I could still hear it and I hope everyone else could also hear uh, the talk. So thank you for keeping in time and we have some time for some questions and I can see there's at least a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A. So let's look at those. Uh, the first one, um, I, th I think Zoe, I, can we ask Phil to um, ask the question directly or should I do that? I don't know whether Phil would be able to talk and if phil wants to he can raise his hand and then we can okay. unmute him. i'm going to be happy to do from the q a okay. box as well i'm going to give I'm an option I'll, I'll give an option to phil would you like to ask the question yourself phil or do you want me to read it out if i don't get a response i'll read it out <laughs> okay i'm going to read out the first hey, I, i've just been asked to unmute sorry oh, Randy. Fantastic. no uh, phil please go ahead with your first question sorry. yeah we'll, we'll i had to get time for the next one yeah, thanks very much. Really, really interesting presentation. I just wanted to hear your views around the travel behaviour change, which is in some ways being made largely impossible, given the the housing developments being uh, put in place right now, um, that all rely on the um, the private car. And I, I, I'm, one in particular is the developments planned on the the, the Shefford Arsley Stockfold corridor uh already a very congested series of roads a507 a1 uh, and there's many thousands of homes going in there without any um in, improvement to any form of transport infrastructure be it public or 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 otherwise so i i just you know really are we locking ourselves into an impossible situation with with regards to behavior change with these developments um the, the short answer is if that continues yes and that's why I emphasize spatial planning. Um, the group that I mentioned, um, Transport for New Homes, um, has been highlighting this. Um, there's a problem in that um, this tends to fall down, um, transport and uh, house building tends to fall down the gap between the two ministries. 
and between different departments. Um, I, it's also the case, I don't think people quite uh, understand the full extent of which, uh, your second question, Phil, that you raised, um, that uh, councils are tied by the uh, by what I think in the case of, of education was called a mutant algorithm. But in this case, it um, pushes um, a requirement on councils to produce a five-year housing land supply, uh, penalises them if they don't, and if they achieve it, then that's, uh, that's treated as a way of ratcheting up um, for the next five years. Um, so um, it's a very, uh, councils find themselves in a very difficult position. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what is happening as a result is, is that the location of new housing is entirely the wrong place. Transport for New Homes talks about cow pat developments plonked in the middle of fields miles from anywhere. And um, the, uh, the, without any commitment to fund, uh, to, as you say, funding infrastructure, and then the design of the developments is car based as well. Um, with, in some cases, without even pavements being put in, because there's an assumption that everybody will just drive everywhere. And um, if you do look at the Transport for New Home site, and in fact, there's a new report which is about to come out that revisits some of the previous uh, estates they looked at uh, and finds that in many cases things have got worse rather than better. Um, it will have recommendations on what to do about this. Um, but one of them is that um, the government should simply, because one of the things that happens is that when, this, uh, when these uh, sustainable transport plans come up, um, the government then uses housing investment funds to fund big roads and roundabouts. And that's certainly what's happening on, say, the M11 uh, around um, Bishop Stortford. Um, I think thanks to... Stephen, we might need to close. Uh, so, so I think there's, I, 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 I mean, and the short answer is Transport for New Homes has been looking at this and there's clearly a big, a, a big issue. And it's running against what government says it wants, which is 15 minute neighborhoods and things like that. Because in fact, everybody has to drive everywhere and usually much more than 15 minutes. Thank you. No, no, fantastic. Let, let's thank uh, Stephen in the usual way, as we would have clapped here by now, but, <laughs> but I'm sure everyone is appreciative of your talk. And Phil, um, I will come back to your questions when we have the panel discussion, because I really want to maintain the panel discussion time as well. So thank you again, Stephen, for an excellent, very interesting start uh, to this afternoon session. We're going to move on to the second talk, which is going to be given by Trevor Brennan from Hertfordshire County Council. And Trevor's talk is on can transport be truly decarbonized? And uh, a wonderful thought provoking question. Um, Trevor, please feel free to say a few words about yourself as you begin your presentation. So over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Trevor Brennan. I work at Hertfordshire County Council as a uh, strategy and programme manager. I also lead some of the work around shared transport uh, at a county. And also for my sins, I'm a part-time student at this very university doing an MBA. Um, so in true student style, I put referencing or Harvard referencing on all my slides. So once they're released, it will save you a lot of running around. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Stephen. So I think some of the things I'm going to say are, are going to support Stephen on, on um, his take on, on certainly on, on COP26 and sort of our opinion. Uh, and I'll try to go in some of the, the, the sort of the, the detail around what does sustainable transport actually mean and, and, and actually can can we true, truly decarbonize it? Um, so what I want to do is just give you a little bit of context to begin with um, and just sort of set out why actually it is quite difficult to sort of decarbonize transport globally and then give you a focus around uh, what happens locally. Um, so uh, principally there are like seven global factors around why, why actually uh, transport uh, decarbonizing is difficult and um, principally our demand for uh, goods and services far outweighs um, uh, the roles and responsibilities we put on climate change and, and decarbonization uh, and actually that 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 sort of global growth is, is due to double uh, by 2050 uh, and, and as a transport provider you know in terms of locally in Hertfordshire it's, it's really, we have to look at the whole transport system, how we move goods and services, how we move people, um, certainly uh, internationally, nationally, but also locally. Um, also, most of global transport is uh, predominantly based on the use of fossil fuels. 
um, in terms of uh, the majority of goods which arrive in the UK are uh, by large container ships or HGVs across the channel. And so there's still a lot of work to do around sort of decarbonizing um, uh, global tankers. And actually electrification is, is sort of an undervalued resource and it's gonna take a while before we actually decarbonize um, uh, global transport in terms of deliveries. Um, you know, as, as Stephen said, we're, we seem to be obsessed with um, electrification of cars. Um, our stance is, is electrification of cars is one consideration, but there are lots of other things we should be doing before uh, electrification. Um, what our fear is, is people will simply move from sitting in congested um, streets and roads in their normal petrol cars, and they'll just transfer to sitting in roads and streets in their EV vehicles. So we've got um, a huge consideration and concern about that. Um, there is this fallacy about um, green travel in terms of aircraft. It's still uh, many years away, um, certainly for long haul and medium haul, uh, we'll still be flying in the similar uh, aircraft we're using at the moment. There might be a shift over to more uh, sustainable um, uh, aircraft fuels, but that's a number of years away. Um, so, so picking up the point about behavior change as well, um, you know, we've, I certainly been in this industry about 20 years and behavior change has always been muted as a, a possible solution. I think, unfortunately, um, people are reluctant to give up their cars. Uh, they're reluctant to give up the cars for use of public transport or walk a cycle. Um, so that's either a status thing or a cultural thing. But the behavior change argument, it, it's very hard. And certainly in areas of, of great poverty or great work, wealth, that's a different conversation. We have these two groups. Uh, and so the, there are huge considerations there. And, and also, I, I actually, we, you know, certainly for the Western world, we're sort of locked into these sort of high carbon intensive services. So the way we shop, the way we travel, the way we eat, it's all uh, heavily decarbonized. Uh, and actually asking a population to reduce their carbon footprint is, is difficult. So that was just a synopsis about where we are. So I've been quite fatalistic around that. But actually, in terms of sort of the, the, the local opportunities, there are things certainly councils can do. Um, but unfortunately, with all these things, and I thought Stephen did indicate, there is a, there is a, a policy gap between um, what sort of national government tell us to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 and the actual carbon savings we have to make. And unfortunately, there is still this gap between the policy and the actual uh, deliverables. And so what Stephen and, and others will outline today is, is actually how can we legitimately uh, fill that gap? So, as I said, um, I work for uh, Hertfordshire County Council. We're just one level of local authority in this conversation. Um, so, for those who don't know, Hertfordshire County Council is the um, uh, the transport authority for Hertfordshire, but it doesn't control the way we plan our homes, schools, city centres. That's all done by the district. So, there is this level of difference and conflict between the two areas. So, the question about why do homes go in a certain level? We can have a certain influence, but ultimately it's not our decision. But as I said, there are three sort of key areas we can consider. So first and foremost is actually um, avoiding the need to travel, um, about facilitating sort of better land use, about where uh, opportunities are based and how do we get them. Um, opportunities around how we shift away from the single occupancy car use to more cycling and walking, and a greater emphasis on public transport. And then also, how do we improve that network we have? So I have, I, I'll talk a little bit about EV provision and where that leads us. So in terms of the avoid, um, Stephen Gladley's covered it off. It's about um, working with our population in terms of, well, actually, if you look at remote working, both uh, industry and education has always said, you know, there is a requirement that uh, students and, and, and uh, you know, workers come together in a central location to carry out their normal jobs. But one of the 
one of the few positives of the pandemic is many organizations just did that pivot overnight. So all those excuses about you can't work from home, you can't learn from home, overnight we actually went and, and changed that. Um, so for us, as uh, we, we need to consider actually will those behaviors change? So actually will our network change because fewer people are using it during peak hours? Um, uh, what has also happened is actually if people are working from home, will that then necessitate a greater use of online shopping? So as a local authority, how do we manage that issue around capacity of, of small empty vans running around our network actually delivering single parcels to different homes. There has to be an element of facilitation and bringing those uh, goods and services together. It's also about uh, potentially supporting plug-in grants for electrification of cars, uh, but also bikes and freight transport. And um, so that's one section avoid. Then we've got how can we avoid all those issues in the first instance? So it's about trying to plan and look at accessible locations. So key services and uh, opportunities are in a single place. It's about having an effective range of um, goods and services within one to five miles of a location. So you're not actively encouraging people to move to and from. They can principally um, accommodate all their needs within a, a small space. It's about looking at compact neighborhoods. So you've got nodes and networks being connected by walking and cycling opportunities as compared to a large uh, road network. And it's about looking at how we can develop developments with less of a need to car. And I'll come on to one of the problems with that and one of the issues we have. So if we then quickly move on to shift, how can we then move shifting? It's about making our places safer and easier to walk and cycle. Uh, so people uh, feel confident and safe to get out of their vehicles and, and do their normal daily business. It's about us as an authority uh, promoting lower speeds in our neighborhoods so people are safer. And actually it's trying to understand now how our HGV traffic on a network, how does that impact on, on the way we travel? Um, it's about making uh, key activities easy to reach. It's about providing those opportunities around connecting. It's a, about providing good permeability in our city centres and our residential areas. So you can easily go from your house to your shops in a shorter time and space than it is to get in your car. Um, and it's also about promoting cycling, walking as a, you know, a normal day, a normal way we commute to work, we commute to school. Um, and it's about supporting that opportunity, about talking about the health benefits, the, the air quality benefits of, of uh, walking and cycling culture. It's about the role of public transport. It's about working with the operators to improve service reliability. Um, it's about uh, addressing congestion issues in city centres. So we make it more attractive for uh, buses to be used because it's a smoother, quicker, safer journey than just sat in traffic. It's about understanding the sort of relative costs of public transport. So the cost of public transport relatively is, is, is increased, whereas the use of car use has gone down and one of the reasons that is actually cars don't fully reflect the cost of congestion they face um, apart from um, uh, ULEZ zones in London and a few key towns such as Bath and Birmingham um, Stephen talked about uh, Leeds and Manchester they're a little bit further down the line but there is some clear evidence certainly from Bath and Birmingham that actually having a clear uh, properly funded and policy clean air zone uh, does make a difference in city centres. It's also about improving the passenger experience. So instead of simply getting in your car, you actually use rail or bus as your first travel choice because it's uh, more convenient, you can you can work, you can use your phone, et cetera. And us as local authorities is about supporting our residents to access those services and talking about the benefits of those. And um, so uh, also we're looking at improving it. Although I talked about EV, there are still some barriers to EV provision. And um, so uh, currently, if you want to buy an EV vehicle, on average, it's about £10,000 more expensive than a, a similar petrol model. Those prices are coming down. And certainly with the uh, government uh, introducing legislation where by 2030, you won't be able to buy a petrol or diesel car. So you've got those barriers to deal with. Um, one of the other key concerns is, is actually everybody you get in their EV vehicle is not 
going to necessarily reduce congestion. What we're quite worried about is we'll simply just um, replace one congestion with another. What we're trying to understand is, is actually would great provision of EV vehicles as sort of a shared service. So you're not, individuals aren't buying EVs, a, a community or street will buy a single EV and then use that. So that's about behavior change, that's about looking at costs. Um, but it's also, uh, in terms of the barriers about EV, is EVs, yes, they will be an improvement in air quality, but still, even if you're an electric vehicle, there are still issues about particulate matter from uh, braking and tyres. So they are much, much better than uh, ICE vehicles, but there's still an issue over um, uh, air quality. Um, on the more positive side, um, as the local authorities, we are looking at actually where we would put infrastructure to support EVs. Um, we're looking, working with uh, EV manufacturers and charging um, and utility firms to say, well, actually, how will the market change? You know, we'll, we'll Will EV provision just become part of your normal day as you would get petrol today? Uh, it's about raising awareness about EV provision because it's not just um, a homeowner will need EVs. You've got other uh, opportunities around taxis, uh, uh, local van deliveries. You know, what does that marketplace look like? Um, also about uh, looking at what local incentives we can bring to, to, to actively encourage more shared opportunities around EVs and this idea of um, having shared vehicles on street, which are also electrified as well. And also um, as a, a major employer in the county, same as the university, uh, same as UNO, is we uh, buy a lot of vehicles. It's about understanding what our own fleet looks like in the future. And just quickly, a bit of promotion about what Hearts are doing. Um, we have a uh, sustainable Hertfordshire strategy sets out our aspirations in terms of uh, meeting our uh, carbon neutrality targets um, and net zero county by 2050. I'm not going to go into detail. The uh, references are on the presentation. So if you are interested in knowing sort of specifically what we're doing, it's all there on the strategy. And um, just the last couple of slides, what I wanted to do is just got to give indication because we do have lots of questions, actually. What was the how was the network operating in Hertfordshire during lockdown? And um, so we have a data team within the council. Uh, this is information we've collected um, principally from um, uh, the third of the second 2020. So this is the flows of traffic during the different phases of lockdown. I'm not going to go into huge detail, but basically it gives you an appreciation of, of because uh, the, the pandemic had an effect on how people work and travel in the county. This is an actual pattern. So at the height of the lockdown, we saw average daily totals 65 percent less than what our baseline year was. But as you can see, if you follow the chart, as the lockdowns open and closed it, the flow of traffic increased and decreased. And, and what was interesting is, is um, National Lockdown 3 end, which is right over here, uh, on our peak hours, we're still seeing uh, slightly fewer vehicles during the peak hours by about uh, 10 to 14 percent, and which is sort of equivalent what you would get during the school holidays. And um, so we haven't returned back to pre-pandemic levels. But what is interesting is how quickly we did come back to going back to that daily commute once the economy and once the businesses opt open. So what that meant overall is we saw about a 30% reduction in the total number of vehicle uses over that period. And so, so for us, as a sort of transport practitioner, we would always say, well, what happened if you could take 30% out of your uh, volume of tracking on daily, what that effect would look like? And in essence, that's, that's what that effect would did. So bringing up the last two slides so bringing up the case and trying to summarize what i've said one of the issues we have is this is a case in point and this is picking up um one of the uh situations stephen was uh, is opening is this is just a um uh dave walker if you follow him on instagram he's really good he does these really good cartoons about transport and carbon and things like that so please take the time to to reach out to today but this is one of the uh what one of the cartoons he puts together about planning so on the uh how things are often unfortunately that is the existing scenario that's how we were building our towns and cities 
is about making it inaccessible for people to walk and cycle, about putting out of town shopping, about making everybody dry to where they would have to access a service, access a school, access a shopping centre. So unfortunately, um, the point made by Philip is actually that that's this that's this unfortunately that's the same situation in a lot of towns and cities within Hertfordshire in the UK I mean as Stephen said is where we actually want to get to and that's a key thing about planning is we need to change the way we plan our the places we live and the places we work so the first port of call is we don't necessarily need to get in our car because services are available you can easily walk um, or, or, or cycle to them if you are getting on public transport the stops are close to where you want to go get off it's got about integrated ticketing so it's easy to get on a bus you don't necessarily need to plan ahead because all the facilities and opportunities are, are there for you so that, that's just a simple diagram of actually the, the problems we've talked about today are, are real but the solutions we could get to and, and so so sort of the key takeaways from today is we need to focus on decarbonisation of, of road and rail to begin with um, through uh, opportunities around electrification, but actually just reducing the number of vehicle movements we have. Um, we can do this through the greater use of public transport. As Stephen has said, we're developing the Hearts Link, which is a on-demand bus service, which is hopefully going to identify how best to sort of service those rural communities where there's few public transport options and um, we're also we publicly launched the, the heart system which is a, a a rapid transit system going from east to west on the county um, we've uh, a huge ask the government and um, that's a, a sort of a new um uh, system in place it, it will take uh, a number of years to build but that might finally provide that public transport alternative to simply getting in your car uh, and it's about actively encouraging uh, more active travel responsibilities Stephen mentioned it we've got this sustainable travel town initiative which is basically we're focusing our efforts with the districts on three key towns within Hertfordshire uh, Royston, Letchworth and Stevenage and um, trying to say you know can we bring all these elements and facets together um, it's about trying to start decarbonisation early because the sooner we do it, uh, you know, it, it's going to the, the sort of benefits will generate earlier and, and people will be less resistant to change. And um, it's about understanding the sort of the wider benefits and costs of EV use. We're still looking at that. Uh, and also, I think what Stephen and others said, it's not just about transport. It's about sort of this whole system approach. It's about looking at how transport fits in with planning, how it's then uh, underpinned by energy, about government policy, it's about how we buy things. So it's this whole system approach. And so finally, this is this is where we are at the moment. Um, and, and I suppose from us, this is this is how our highways network at the moment. It's there's a predominance of car domination. It's it's wide roads. You're making it easy for people to simply get in the car. And finally, where we want to is we, we want to get to this point. We want to have uh, streets and places integrated. Um, so it's a people first approach. Um, uh, single occupancy vehicles are out or off our network. If you do need to drive, it's, it's a shared opportunity. Um, you're able to walk and cycle. You've got green spaces and you have opportunities to cycle. Okay, that is me done. Okay. We, should, we should stop there now. I'm done. I'm done. Fantastic. <laughs> that was uh, you've raised lots and lots of uh, very interesting points in your uh, presentation. So thank you for that. But uh, okay. in order to keep uh, with time and we, as I said, we want to have more uh, a longer panel uh, session at the end, we will move to the next speaker. So thank you. Um, if everyone can thank Trevor for a, uh, an exhilarating talk with lots of points that I've made a note myself to ask you but later on. So let's move on to the third and the final speaker, and that is Ed Cameron. Uh, he's a commercial manager uh, for Unobus, and uh, Cameron's talk is on get on board for an even cleaner future. So over to you, Ed. Thank you, Ranji. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ranji said, uh, my name's Ed Cameron. I'm the commercial manager for Unobus, um, based in Hatfield. Um, so a little bit of background, first of all, just to set the scene. So who are Uno? So our history dates back about 30 years. Um, 
we were founded in 1992 as University Bus. Um, we were rebranded as UNO in 2005, which was just a recognition that you know, we, we serve a wider market than just the university community. Um, 2012, we began running buses in Northampton for the university there, and a year later for Cranfield University over in Bedfordshire. And we also run buses in London. So 2015, UNO was awarded it, our first TFL, so Transport for London, route and we currently operate two routes for TFL and I believe we're the university's only university owned bus company. So just to set the scene on a map that's that's where we run uh, pre-COVID so you know in, in a normal year we employed about 40 engineers, administrators, supervisors, run about 100 buses, we employ about 200 drivers our buses cover about 3 million miles a year in service, and we carry getting on for 4.5 million passengers a year in Hertfordshire, which makes us the second largest operator. So, you know, there's been a lot spoken today about um, how people move around and habits and how we move goods and, and, and so on around. The obvious thing to state, of course, is that transport, whether it's goods or people generates emissions. And in uh, 2018, transport was the largest sector of domestic greenhouse gas emissions. So it's about 28% of, of total emissions. And in the last 30 years, transport emissions have reduced by just 3%. So it's a big part of our, you know, the problem we need to solve and we're not really making any headway into, into solving it. There's, you know, we, we've spoken and, and Trevor picked up on, on points in the last sort of 18 months, there's been a lot of um, change in our habits that's almost been forced upon us uh, because of the, the various lockdowns and restrictions and so on out of the pandemic. But I think what's, what's clear while there's, there's opportunities for people to work from home and to do you know, remote meetings such as the one we're doing today, what is really clear is that people like being with other people and there's real benefit in socialising, you know, networking. I always prefer these sorts of events when you can have a cup of coffee and a, a biscuit afterwards and actually have a proper chat with people. Um, so I don't think that need to move around, that desire and, and, and want to move around is going to go anywhere. In fact, I think it, it, it comes back quite quickly. And Trevor's graphs were quite interesting, showing the, you know, how quickly the, the volumes of traffic have, have bounced back. So if we accept that people want to move around and there's, there's a need to move around, we've obviously got to find a way to do it. So how do we do that sustainably? You know, we need, to, it's, it's really clear, we need to reduce our congestion, particularly in, in cities, uh, but also in some of the towns uh, and even, you know, in, in some of the larger villages in Hertfordshire. We need to reduce emissions from transport. And actually, there's a need to improve social inclusion. So I've borrowed this photo from um, friends up in Lothian buses, and it's from, a, I think, a year or two ago. But very simply, it shows on the right hand side, it's 100 cars, which fill three lanes of that street and a bit of the pavement in the middle. And if everyone in each of those single occupancy cars were to use the bus, that one bus on the left hand side would carry everyone where they want to go. But obviously, there's a stark contrast in the amount of road space. So public transport and buses are obviously a big part of that can go a long way into reducing congestion simply because it's, it's a much more efficient use of, of what limited road space we have. And I mentioned about people earlier on briefly, but for many people, you know, using the bus is a very important part of their social um, lives. You know, it's, it's important for them to get out, to mix with other people, to meet new people, to see friends and so on. And sometimes, um, very simply, that's just sitting next to someone on the bus and having a bit of a chatter. And I don't think we should, you know, we shouldn't belittle that. that that's a, a very significantly important part of some people's lives. But if we move on to 
emissions and, and air pollution and air quality, public transport can really make significant difference, significant improvements in that. So I borrowed some slides from a trade organization called CPT. Uh, and this one, you know, very simply says, you know, the latest Euro 6 diesel buses and coaches produce less nitrogen oxide than the latest diesel cars. And if you read that again, the bit in the middle, that is per vehicle. So a single bus or coach produces less nitrogen oxide than a single car. And obviously a bus or coach can carry 40, 50, 60 people very comfortably. And if we think about modal shift, um, this is where you know, public transport can make some real um, improvements very, very quickly. So if everyone takes one bus journey a month more than they're doing currently, carbon dioxide emissions be reduced by 2 million tonnes a year. That's just one journey a month. And if you think, you know, most people make two, three, four journeys a day. So 100 a month, one in 100 journeys you do by bus instead of by car. That's the outcome in terms of reducing carbon emissions. And a lot of people will say, well, surely there's a role for technology to play in, in this as well. And yes, undoubtedly there is. So at UNO, we run some transport for London services and the, these buses we've been running for a year now. Uh, they're fully electric. So they've got, you know, there is zero tailpipe emissions. Um, and I think that replaces, it will start to replace diesel buses, of course it will. And there's lots of other options as well. So hydrogen is an option and this, this uh, uh, diagram shows the development of some of the latest hydrogen buses. Um, they're obviously having to be engineered in a slightly different way. And in terms of operating hydrogen buses, there's uh, some differences compared to diesel, um, but there's, there's clear benefits in terms of emissions as well. And only yesterday I was up in Coventry um, Volvo, one of, one of the UK's bus suppliers, have just launched uh, this week their new uh, double-deck and single-deck electric chassis. And there's, there's an awful lot of development that's gone into this um, to make them, uh, you know, A, more affordable because they're jolly expensive. Um, and so, you know, they've, they've thought through their impact on the environment in terms of construction, but also in terms of use in years to come. But the stark fact is that battery electric vehicles and to some extent hydrogen vehicles, they just don't have the range for the services that our customers want. So if we're to convert our existing network of public transport to zero emission hydrogen or electric vehicles, the very fact is here and now today, we will need a larger fleet of buses and we will need more, more drivers to provide the same service. So just to start to round up, you know, if everyone were to make six bus journeys a year in place of uh, a, a journey by car, if they were to do that by bus or by coach, the effect on emissions and the improvements in our air quality would be equal to converting the UK's entire bus fleet to zero emissions. So yes, trans you know, technology has a role to play in that but modal shift can start to have some really significant impacts. So if there was a takeaway from today, there is a bus network in Hertfordshire. They're not just pink and purple buses that we run. There's, you know, seven or eight bus companies. There's several rail links. Uh, there's new demand responsive transport in Northeast Hertfordshire that's just started a few months ago. Um, it's, it's with us here and now. And as individuals, you know, we need to recognize that we can't continue our lifestyles as they are and just rely on cleaner technology to solve the problems. If we start to make choices and those choices mean, you know, moving to public transport, to walking, to cycling, to lift sharing, blended with some, you know, working from home, online shopping and those sorts of things, I think actually we can very quickly start to make some improvements to that. Thank you very much for that. And I'll hand back to Ranjit. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for a, a great presentation. And 
there's a lot that I've learned. I didn't know what, uh, how big and how successful Uno, um, um, Uno company is at the moment. Uh, and I didn't certainly realize uh, your geographical reach. Um, th th there is one question that's come from David Lauder that I want to paraphrase. There's a couple of questions that are interrelated, Ed, and I, I don't want to turn this into a complaint, complaint session, but there's a, the general question appears to be, uh, whilst we all want to have sustainable transport and, and reduce congestion, and uh, uh, at the same time, how does a company address the needs of, of of local communities, for example, David gave an example that a bus stop has been removed. Um, if how, how do you put that together and 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 really close that loop? That what are the needs and how do you address it? Because local needs can be very different from national needs as well. As well, can they? They, they can be, and you know, I, th I think you know it's it's really important to recognise that the current public transport network. You know, it exists. It's here now. Buses are running. We've, you know, we run a hundred buses. Arriva run two or three hundred buses. It's not enough. You know, and I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying that um, public transport can meet everyone's needs for every journey that they make every day. I think it would be unrealistic to try and to try and say that. <clears throat> I think the, you know, the emphasis needs to be on starting modal shift away from everyone using a car for most journeys. To considering, you know, if you're going into the centre of St Albans or you're heading into London, use the bus, use the train, because those options are there here and now. And you know, the the knock-on effect of that will mean that there's more investment in public transport, that there's slightly fewer cars on the road, which means journeys are quicker. That bus has become more reliable. Um, and of course, the other thing to to mention is that in the spring this year. I think Stephen mentioned it in his presentation, the government published their Bus Back Better paper, which is all about getting bus companies sitting down with each other and with the local authority and saying, you know, what we've got isn't bad, but it's far from perfect. So what do we need to do to shape it and make it better um, to meet the needs of more people in the community? Um, and how can we go about actually implementing that in the, in the next couple of years? Um, and there's some investment coming from government that local authorities are bidding for and bus operators will commit to doing things as part of that as well. Um, but I think, you know, that it's, it's this kind of here and now, well, do I need to use the car or could I use the bus? Could I walk? Could I cycle? Could I lift you? It's that, that kind of step change in our, in our attitude to moving around, that I think, is important. No, thank, thank you, Ed. We, we uh, didn't have time to ask Trevor a question. And I, before we move to the more general panel-based questions, Trevor, I, I had a question for you, really. Uh, um, you mentioned, you actually showed this, I think it was your presentation, that showed this graph where there was a very large gap between the policy and uh, what, you, what we are trying to achieve with, uh, with net zero targets. That was a huge gap, isn't it? I mean, I've seen those graphs and I'm always shocked in some sense and how are we going to bridge this gap? From your perspective, look, looking at decarbonization of transport, I mean, how, how much of that gap do you think you could be addressing or how could we all address and how could we reduce yeah, it? No, uh, no that's, an, and that's an excellent question and, and that, that piece of work we are doing at the moment. And so uh, what we're trying to do is sort of map the requirement for what so um, as an authority, we're required to, or we, there isn't a requirement, we've stated we want a net zero county by 2050 or so. So we need to understand of that opportunity, what that gives us. So for Hertfordshire as a, as, an, an, a, as a whole, we're probably only responsible for around like 50% of our network. So we're responsible for um, uh, local and some of the major roads. But we also have uh, strategic roads, it's the M25, M1, etc. And um, so it's trying to understand our roles and responsibilities in terms of that. So I think what will eventually happen, uh, and that when the government 
have just published, uh, updated their sort of decarbonisation plan in July of this year, and there's more work to be done. But we think what will happen, and, and sort of Stephen mentioned it, is as an authority, we're required to uh, produce a local transport plan. And um, so that's a statutory obligation we need to set out to the, the wider community in Hertfordshire in terms of transport, what's our roles and responsibilities and what actions we're going to take. Um, and I think what will happen is the government will say, Hertfordshire, Essex, you know, any of the any of the shire counties is for you to we will only provide funding if you set out how you're going to decarbonize your transport network. Uh, and I think fundamentally that that will have a, a great influence on us. And um, so what that will look like, that will probably look like um, a less investment in road building, if at all. It will be uh, an investment in public transport, walking and cycling and, and sort of the electrification of our um, uh, passenger and freight uh, movements. Simply, that's the only way. And fundamentally, the only way we decarbonise our transport, uh, uh, transport is if people do not use their their, their uh, cars on a daily basis. That's the only way. And um, if people adopted active travel, uh, use public transport, that's the only way. It, we will struggle to meet our targets just by technological solution. And so it is about people making those positive changes and using alternatives to their cars, in essence. No, thank you, thank you for that answer. Uh, I, I'm going to start off, let's move on to the general panel discussion um, now. I'm going to start with a, a question first, which will give time to um, uh, the UH events team to see whether Loretta uh, and Phil wish to ask their questions. Then there are a number of specific questions. For example, David Lauder has put some questions and I'm gonna suggest if the speakers maybe can type them because they're, they're quite specific questions. And I want to reserve the last 20 minutes or so to more strategic overreaching questions. So let, let, let me begin with uh, the question, which is an obvious one really. We've just, um, we're now, what is it, 18 months or nearly two years into the lockdown in one form or another in the pandemic, aftermath of the pandemic. What lessons do you think we can learn? And, and a couple of your presentations did touch upon this. What lessons do you think we can learn which, which we can translate into the future transport planning policies. So I'm going to start with Stephen first and then then go to, to Ed and to, to Trevor. Well, uh, thank you, um, Ranjit. Um, I think, um, I, as uh, Trevor has said, we've learned that um, uh, travel patterns do adjust, can adjust really quite quickly, uh, almost overnight. In terms of where that takes us in the future, um, I think um, it's hard to say, but it's quite clear that um, working from home uh, or, or at least some or part of the week for office-based workers is, is a thing now. It's um, <clears throat> The pandemic's accelerated a trend that was starting before that. Um, and, um, uh, and, and some business travel, for example, to um, events like this um, will reduce as well. Um, and that will have impacts on public transport um, and more generally, I, I mean, we talk about a car-led recovery, but I, and actually there is a car-led recovery going on, but actually what we're seeing is a leisure-led recovery, so that at weekends and, uh, and other uh, times that were formerly referred to as off-peak, um, some public transport use is more or less back to where it was, um, and uh, whereas uh, during the week it's still well down. Um, and as Trevor said, um, yeah, the counts in Harpeter suggest that the former peak hours are, are, st um, are still down even, you know, traffic levels on the roads to where they were. Um, so I think there's some big adjustments to be made there. Um, I do think there's a risk that government will just take a quite a hard-nosed um, treasury uh, perspective on this and go, right, OK, public transport use has fallen, right, we're going to cut the funding. Um, and... Uh, um, and there's certainly some sense of that going on in the um, uh, on rail, um, and um, and certainly with t uh, there's a TFL argument as well as people will have seen. So I think um, uh, that would be a huge mistake. Other countries are um, seizing on rail and public transport as the backbone of a zero carbon transport um, uh, revolution. 
Uh, the new German government's just committed to spending more on rail than on road and to um, having modal shift to rail for passengers and freight. Um, and um, Austria's launched a climate ticket that's three euros a day for um, the, whole, the whole country's public transport network. Though, of course, with lockdowns, there, I suspect you can't use it very much at the moment. But um, nonetheless, that shows the kinds of initiatives we need to be looking at. Okay. So I think that, uh, so um, I think the combination of COVID and climate change is going to take um, lead to some quite big changes in behaviour. Okay. No, thank you, Ed. Ed were there any lessons? Uh, also, what was discussed in COP twenty six for companies like such as yours? I, I think you know that there wasn't there wasn't a huge amount of emphasis in terms of modal shift, and it, it's it's a, it's a really um, you know, it's really unfortunate. There's lots of emphasis on, you know, zero emissions and, you know, moving to electric vehicles and those sorts of things. And yes, as I said, you know, there, there's value and there's need to do that, but it, it doesn't happen. You know, you, we're not going to achieve any of the targets that we've set for transport emissions just mm -hmm. by, you know, switching everything to electric, be them buses or cars. It's got to be a real step change in behaviour. What was really stark, um, you know, almost at a personal level, last sort of March, April, May, in the, you know, the, the, the peak of the pandemic and in, in the first lockdown, when car traffic was, was really significantly reduced, was actually everyone was saying to each other, this is really pleasant, you know, I, I can walk down the street and hear the person I'm talking to, because there's not that, that level of thing, you know, my kids feel safe walking down to the shop and back. And, you know, the circumstances for that were, um, were pretty awful, and it, it was sort of enforced upon us. But that was one, you know, really strong benefit that, that came out of that. You know, so we all, there's this sort of desire and, and you know, that everyone realises that there's benefits to it. We just need to be brave enough actually to, you know, to change our behaviour, to change the technology we're using and all the things we talked about, actually to put that in place as, as a permanent thing and not just during a, you know, a brief lockdown for a few months. Okay, no, fantastic. Good. Uh, Trevor, I have a specific question for you, but I'm going to put that on hold because I would like the audience to be asking questions. So, Phil, did you want to ask your question or did you want me to read it? Um, Zoe, what do you want me to do? Uh, again, Phil is more than welcome to, cut, to put his hand up and, and ask the question. Yeah, if, if Phil, yeah. Phil, do you want to ask your question? I can't see a hand up. Okay, I'm going to then uh, try and paraphrase Phil Porter's question. Oh, he just put his hand up. Let him Was he? <laughs> okay, go for it. Go for it. Sorry, this is very weird because I'm saying yes, yes, yes at the microphone. And nobody can hear me. Yeah, it was. Uh, can, I've got. To Two questions, but the specific one I'll save. Uh, this was a general question. One, Phil. Phil, if you yeah. can keep to one, and then if yeah, we no problem, we'll go to the second one. Yeah, right? great. Uh, general question. Uh, so, given the pressures on local authorities from government, which have been alluded to in in several of the talks, uh, and the lack of what appears to be appropriate planning, development, and travel plans, uh, how can the situation be changed? Uh, are we in the UK resigned to locking into that high carbon housing with poor transport links scenario, which is currently being built before our very eyes? Uh, and I'm just struggling to see how the necessary changes can be made under the current legislative restriction. And so I'll be really interested to hear everyone's comments or views on that. Seems a bit of an impossible task at the moment, uh, especially given that this is happening right now. We are having mass what i view as inappropriate developments being built i'm happy to pick that one up ranjit if you want me to um well briefly phil um uh, it, it is bad but i don't think it's an, it, it's uh, irretrievable um the reason for that is firstly um from the transport for new homes work actually some of the stuff can be retrofitted um uh, some of the walking and cycling stuff in some of these estates, um, it, you know, it, it, it's small matters of removing fences and putting in proper crossings in some cases. Um, uh, we, uh, at the moment, it's really difficult for people to, um, uh, uh, for people to uh, walk and cycle in some of these estates. As I said, some of them don't have pavements, and I've given um, David Lauder some examples in the chat. Um, and... Um, uh, you know, it's possible to um, uh, to retrofit this stuff. Secondly, 
Um, in terms of um, how we actually provide some decent public transport, um, I think land value capture offers one way into this. Um, the um, Northumberland County Council is just reopening, uh, is looking at reopening a railway line and have had some work done by a grouping that's worked out that you could get, they could get 30 to 40% of the costs from landowners along the route. Um, and I, I've introduced them to uh, Trevor and his colleagues on this because um, the East-West Rapid Transit um, network that Harpeth are talking about could easily be funded with some developer contributions I'm not saying that's all of it, but it, it should have some of it. Um, and um, so I think there's opportunities for that. I, and there are also players around Hertfordshire, people like um, Gascoigne Estates, who are um, obviously Lord Salisbury is the Chancellor of the University, um, have been very committed to talking about, you know, to putting up alternatives to car-based development. Um, there's one other, a, a brutal point about this, though, is that um, that car-based um, approach doesn't work in its own terms because what happens is that it just congests the surrounding road network. So actually, I think just for congestion purposes and also for the politics, as we have seen in the Cheshire Amish and by-election, um, a lot of grassroots voters that really don't like that car-based development very much uh, on the, on their doorstep because they can see it's generating uh, traffic congestion. So I think that the uh, that it's self-destruct uh, is self. Uh, destruct um, uh, in self-destruct mode that approach and it will be replaced and there are opportunities to do that. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There, was, there was a question uh, from Loretta which seems to have disappeared on my list but anyway it was it was an interesting question I thought um, uh, to, to Trevor and to Ed that whether um, public transport can be made more innovative to cater for actual needs of the community and not just to transport them, but what are they going to be, why are they, why are they traveling? So um, it uh, be... Ranjit, it's in the answered section. Oh, uh, is it? It's gone I there. But I, I just wanted it, to, it, like, it maybe that's a really interesting one. I just thought if Trevor and Ed can, can comment on it and let everyone know more about their views on it. Uh, I mean, I can see this. In fact, I, on a personal basis, I can relate to that that I'm traveling for a purpose. So there was an example of shopping and there's an example of going out at night. I mean, what, what are, I mean, how can, how, do, how can public transport cater for these kind of needs as well as keeping carbon neutrality? Yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, Ed will probably pick, do the very bus specific. I, I mean, from, from our point of view, I, I, where, where, where we want to get to and I think where we are trying to get to um, so firstly, I'll respond to, to Philip's question. It is really, really hard. Um, it's a con it's a daily battle in terms of um, working across the, the piece in terms of uh, planning development. And, and actually, you know, I work with a lot of good people and we all feel exactly the same that actually um, uh, car development is is the wrong way to go and, and, and you know rest assured lots of people are, are fighting hard for that and, and actually from Hertfordshire point of view is we, we we we've really got no excuse we've we've got the, the policies in place basically say we shouldn't have a car dependent or dominant development um uh, the the where where the problems arise is is, is lack of funding um, and lack of uh, commitment nationally uh, in terms of policies, but also locally. And um, so we are going to get to a point where there are no excuses. I think going forward, I think Stephen's indicated there are developments coming to the fore, like um, uh, Gilston Garden Town and these sort of major areas where um, transport has, has been part of the development process. Um, so Gilston, for example, I think um, the, the requirement is 50% of journeys to Gilston will be sustainable and there'll be 60% of journeys within the Gilston Garden communities where those journeys, uh, which would have previously been done by car, are replaced by walking and cycling. So it is it's technically possible, but it, it, is, a, it is a hard slot. Um, in terms of the question around, uh, around bus provision, how... I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I know a little bit about public transport. Certainly for my own use, I've been up and down to Edinburgh the last uh, few weeks. And what I have found is, is when you have, um, when you have uh, a network which is, is dense, 
and it's easy ticketing and it's convenient and the frequency is right and people will use it. Um, uh, one of the issues we have in Hertfordshire is, is Hertfordshire is much, much bigger. Um, some services in terms of frequency, you do get them in the major urban conurbations, but it, it is hard because it, it, it's, it's costly for um, services to operate without patronage. And that's the sort of the, the, the uh, catch 22 we have. Um, so from our side, if you've got the frequencies right, the, the, uh, the infrastructure is right, the technology and ticketing is right. And we as a highways authority make it easier for buses to operate on a congested network. We're, we're, we, we, we hope that people will simply say it's convenient and it's less hassle and it's more cost effective to use a bus than it is to sit in a, a congested road. That's that's where we want to get to. No, oh, okay, fantastic. Uh, Ed, did you want to add to your written answer? Yeah, I'll just just expand on that a little bit. I mean, obviously, you know, I I work for a bus company. We run buses, and I think we do them very well. I think we're far from perfect. And I think the provision of transport has to move away from a perception that it's just big buses doing very fixed things and nothing else. I think there's a there's a much better mix to be had. And we're starting to look at that probably many, many years too late, if I'm entirely honest. Um, I mean, we've mentioned a few times Hearts Links, where we, which is where we use uh, very small minibuses, the 13 seat minibuses, and they run on a demand responsive network. So it, it's the sort of rural communities in northeast Hertfordshire at the moment, and it may be expanded beyond that in the future. And very simply, you know, there, there are places where it's not economically viable to run a, a regular fixed route, but where you can provide transport on demand. So people book um, the times and days they need to travel and the bus will come on those times and days only. Um, and I think, you know, moving forward, there's probably lots of other solutions as well. And I think we need to be open to that. It might be appropriate that there are, you know, there's some form of autonomy um, involved in that. It might be smaller pods that see eight people, for example. I mean, you know, with there's, I think, Stephen, you mentioned Hart and Trevor, you have as well, which is the sort of east-west link. And I don't think there's been a, a mode of transport sort of set in stone for that. And it might be appropriate in five or 10 years that there's something new that we don't quite know about in this circle here today. So yes, I, I think, you know, I think fixed and scheduled regular big buses will always have a play because they're a very efficient use of road space. They're a very um, efficient use of energy, if you like, and they, you know, they can, as, as I said earlier, they can help very quickly to reduce emissions I think there's more to it than that, and we need to be very open to it as, as things evolve. Don't we? Okay, now thank you very much. Phil, did you want to ask your second question? Because we still have a few more minutes. I have a number of questions, but uh, Phil, did you want to ask your second question? I'm just enabling him to speak now. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, uh, Stephen's actually answered it, Ranji, but okay. it's just about what, what the best way forward for a rail travel was. Um, there's a lot of talk in the industry about hydrogen power, uh, but my view was that overhead electrification was the way forward. And I think Stephen's just confirmed that, at least for main lines. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank, thank you, Phil. Uh, I mean, there are a number of options that are, that, that are being raised. Uh, one, one, one aspect that was touched upon was behavioral, uh, you know, how do we change people's behaviors? And, and um, I, I'm a more physical scientist, so, but it still interests me because I have to change my own behavior in order, you know, in order to uh, uh, support the, the travel towards, you know, low carbon uh, society. How do, how do the three of you feel that, just taking examples of travel patterns, we're so used to our cars or traveling in a certain way. There are different requirements, whether yeah. you are in a rural setting, and I'm in a semi-rural setting. I mean, if I were living in a city, I would probably travel very differently. Uh, so there are different pressures, people. And I saw this very idyllic picture that uh, Trevor had put at the end, this is what we want to try and achieve. But how do we carry people? and and you know, how do you how do you really change people's behavior in a big way that you can make that kind of an imagery 
a reality. So let, let me let me start from Trevor because I saw your it was your image that one of your last slides that sort of prompted this question, and then I'll move. Yeah, to no, um, yeah, no, th thank you. Um, yeah, from our it's a it's a really difficult call. I, I think I said in my presentation, you know, we are, you know, unfortunately reluctant to to give up our single occupancy vehicle or fly let fly fly less. Um, you know, there is an element. It's my my God given right to, uh, to 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 do what I want to do. Um, I think where where it works most effectively is is there is an there is an element of carrot and stick to this. Um, so if you if you look at what TfL have done in London, where they are the uh, provider of of uh, public transport. Um, they're also the uh, provider of uh, uh, cycling and walking infrastructure. Um, so they've got that facet on one hand to say, you know, Londoners, you, you can travel like this in a more sustainable way. Um, and then they also have the stick of the ULES zone and things like that. Um, so I, I think just, you know, asking people to change habits, the, the whole nudge theory and all that sort of stuff, I don't think it's it's going to make a desired effect. I, I think from a, a public policy point of view, there will have to be an element of, of stick. So that, that stick could be um, uh, financial uh, penalties in terms of uh, using a network at particular times, or uh, employers and schools changing their opening and closing times. So you shift those uh, travel patterns. Um, on, the, um, uh, on the reward side is uh, rewarding people who choose to change their uh, commute, com uh, commuter mode, et cetera. So there are sort of like uh, um, carrot, and, uh, carrot and stick opportunities, but it's, a re it's, it's, re it's really hard to, to get people out of the cars. Um, and sort of picking up my, my my planning thing, if you make it easier for people to walk and cycle to go from point A to point B, and then it is to drive in the car, that is maybe one solution in terms of that sort of planning development. But then you've got the issue of how do you get people from settlement A to settlement B? And yeah, it's, it has all these knock-on consequences. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Trevor. I mean, and Stephen, I think people's awareness of that we have to do something or we have to do things ourselves as well um, to try and mitigate the impacts of climate change it is, I think it's, it's, you know, the awareness is increasing. So there's, it's, it's a balance, isn't it, when you change people's behavior individually. It's, it's the necessity, it's safety issues, it's convenience. There are many, many elements. I mean, how, what's your take on that, Stephen, on, in terms of behavioral change? Yes. Um... Uh, it, there's, I mean, this is a, a big area. Actually, one of the people involved in the um, Smart Mobility Unit is a behaviour psychologist, um, Nick Reed, and uh, he has strong views about this, um, uh, uh, which is if you want to ask people why they behave a particular way, you ask them, um, which isn't uh, very complicated. Um, I think one of the um, ways into this is through um, a, a, an approach called life transitions, which is you pick you get at people when to changing their behaviour when they're other when they're moving house, job, school, university, etc., and give them um, good in, uh, information and incentives. Because, um, uh, uh, as you say, uh, Ranjit, um, people are locked into um, their traditional behaviour. But actually, um, uh, if you get them when they uh, when that behaviour is changing. Um, when they're having to change their travel patterns, any their, their um, general life anyway, um, then, for example, getting estate agents to give information on uh, public transport, giving employ getting employers to give information on alternatives to single occupancy car use for new employees, and so on, um, you can make quite a big difference. Um, I also think that that um, the thing I put in my presentation about working with travel generators, for example, um, employers. Um, will uh, it, it is a way into this because it helps um, generate um, it, it's one of the um, incentives behavior change if your employer for example gives incentives for car sharing and makes the car sharing places nearest the office door you're more like it's more likely to make, and puts in slide and showers for cyclists and so on you're more likely to see um, behavior change um, so I, th I think those are ways into it. And actually, the university could talk about this because um, 
when I first came across the university years ago, there was lots of parking on site and now there's hardly any. And if anybody wants to drive into the university site, they have to get a permit. Um, and um, all that's migrated to the park and ride, which its company operates. So um, that does tell you that behavior change. Uh, and, you know, there's a bus gate at the uh, at the top end of the main uh, um, college lane site and so on. So uh, the university has done some of this itself and it has changed travel behavior among its staff and, and students. OK, no, fantastic, fantastic. OK, we, we, we have three minutes and there's three of you. I'm going to give you approximately one minute <laughs> to have some to highlight some of the key points as you see it that can contribute to sustainable transport and linking it to to the overall aim of, of a net zero society. Uh, did you want to start, Trevor, and then I'll go to Ed and then to Stephen at the end. One minute. I probably won't take the full full minute. I, I think from our point of view, I, I think uh, from a policy point of view, we're, we're, we're still struggling with the sort of the, the enormous changes we have to weigh, have to make in terms of the, the way the way we live in terms of society, because I, I think as I said at the beginning it is uh, sort of um, global transport is is, you know, is due to double in its size just to meet this this sort of western appetite about consumerism and i buy into it every day I've, i bought something on black friday today to arrive amazon tomorrow so i'm no say on this um yeah so there's that issue and, and i think um i think where we are losing the argument is um uh, lots of people are just seeing ev vehicles as the, the solution the panacea here it, it, it'll be fine it'll improve air quality my huge worry is is um, the, the, the sort of capacity to, um, you know, we've got 250,000 EV charging posts in the UK at the moment. You know, what the government is saying is we need to get 10 times as much just to provide the, 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 the infrastructure we need. So there's, I think that's a big, a big red herring, whereas actually, you know, if we actively encourage people to walk and cycle and use public transport as their first choice actually EV provision doesn't become that necessity. Whereas unfortunately, you know, globally at COP and, you know, car manufacturers, it's the use of EVs, that's all our solutions, which, which I do worry about. Ranjit, you're on mute. I presume you were going to ask me to do this. Uh, yes, Ed, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, I, I think, you know, the, the thing that we've we've all picked up on here, and we, you know, we haven't compared notes beforehand, is it's not just a technology solution. There's a there's a need to change our behaviour, um, and actually that need is really really quite urgent, if we're honest, because it's not an awful lot of time before some of these targets that are set start to come around. So you know, the one thing I challenge people to do is just look for opportunities to you know let, rely less on your car. You know pick up one of our bus times books, download our app, you know, look at somewhere you could walk or cycle to instead of taking the car. And just those one or two trips a month collectively will start to have an impact. And then, the, you know, the snowball effect of that is there's, you know, it then starts to fund more and more investment in public transport, which leads to more opportunities for people to do that, that modal shift. Okay, no, no, thank you very much. There is a question about how companies can link together in order to connect travel patterns and so on. Maybe you can address that in, in the Q&A. Uh, Stephen, one minute, last last points that you want to oh, exactly leave that. as take so on I messages. Think, um, uh, I think there is something about um, uh, companies linking together to do this. Uh, they're encouraged to do by the scope three of um, uh, carbon reduction that they encourage to report on. Um, and I, I think I'd, I'd just end by saying, um, like with Ed and Trevor, it is possible to do something about this, and it's possible to do something even in places like Hertfordshire. Um, so, um, watching the some of the debates in St Albans at the moment, um, you, uh, uh, where there's a lot of argument going on about traffic and travel, um, as if climate change wasn't real serious and needing something done about it. Um, uh, you know, you'd be forgiven for thinking that uh, some of this was. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, out of the question, but I think it is possible to do something about it. And um, as I've said, the um, university and uh, the Smart Mobility Unit and the other units involved have a role to play. 
Oh, no, no, thank you very much. Okay, we've come to the end. I think we've had some we've had some very thought provoking ideas raised today. So thank you to the three speakers, to Ed Cameron, to Trevor Brennan, and also to Stephen Joseph for taking the time and giving us their thoughts and sharing them with us. And I want to thank also um, our audience and for raising some fantastic questions. There are just so many questions we could have discussed today. I mean, I have a list which I didn't even get through. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Zoe, Nana and Emma and all the people from UH events team. In fact, I'm going to ask Zoe um, and, and Nana and, and Emma to stay back for a couple of minutes just for us to have some feedback with myself. But the messages are clear that, as Stephen said, and Ed and also Trevor, that we can make a we can make a contribution. At the same time, I think people have raised some challenges that we are by no means at, at, a, at a stage where we can suddenly travel and go where we want to do and keep our lifestyles and get rid of the car. <laughs> so, but we need to be moving along that route. And I think that's the, that's the motivation that we have from everyone. And that's the message that we need to be taking that yes, we can have an impact individually as well. Uh, and and thank you to everybody. So thank you again, and I hope to um, I I hope to talk to you again, maybe individually, at some other other meetings. Um, and I will uh, I will like to thank everybody and have a good evening and enjoy your weekend. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. As bye -bye. well for being an excellent chair. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye everyone. You can probably leave at your end if you want, if Ranjit wanted to, because I can't end this meeting without everyone. Um, Fine. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Stephen. Bye. 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 Thank you. Speak to you soon. Okay, so Nana, we can have a, a separate catch up. Is that all right? No, it's, um, I think everyone's almost leaving, so we're good. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, normally I have to end it. We've just got a few more. Um, no problems. I'll, 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 yeah. Two minutes, just one minute, even. Yeah, no problems at all. Um.